Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. I say that because I see people are here from all over the world and Lindsay Jean is from not Massachusetts. So <laughs> I want to make sure her fans are uh, welcome here as well. Um, so before I introduce Lindsay Jean, I'm going to just say a couple things. One is I'd like to thank the friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programs. We could not do this without them. And also Lindsay Jean, who offered or allowed us to partner with other libraries in the area to um, bring this talk to their communities. And I was, as I told her, blown away because we had 32 libraries sign on. So normally I would welcome you all individually, but I think I'm going to put that in the chat because I want all of time to go to Lindsay Jean today. So um, you can buy signed books from Lindsay Jean from Aesop's Fables. I will put that in the chat as well. We will be taking questions after Lindsay Jean's um, uh, presentation. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Use that. Please use the chat to chat with each other. If you find something really interesting or if you have a um, you know, an equally interesting recipe, throw it into the chat. We want to hear from you. So. Um, with that, I will throw it over to Lindsay Jean, who is, as I said, a cookbook author of Cooking with Scraps. I discovered her, <laughs> although she was already discovered. I saw her on the Food Network um, on The Kitchen, which is one of my very favorite shows, and she was cooking with scraps. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. So not only does she cook with scraps and write, with, um, write cookbooks, but she also is, I think, a sustainability warrior. But I also know there's probably much more to your story. So welcome, Lindsay Jean. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with all of you and get started talking about cooking with scraps and how we could all make a difference. So I will go ahead and jump in to my presentation. Thank you. All right. So as you know, my name is Lindsay Jean. I will also answer to LJ because sometimes I know that three syllables can be a lot for folks. So we're gonna start right off with a pop quiz. Not really, we're gonna come back to it, but I just want you to take a minute to look through everything that's on this list right now and start to think about these things. Think about whether they're edible, think about uh, which ones of these you're already using. Think about which ones you're pretty sure aren't edible. And we will circle back to this, um, but you will hopefully hear some of the answers as I start to talk about things. So right off the bat, I want to address what does cooking with scraps mean? Sometimes people hear the phrase cooking with scraps and they think that I'm talking to you about garbage or encouraging you to go dumpster diving or eat moldy food and none of these things are the case. And I will admit that maybe there could be a sexier term than food scraps, um, but we are not encouraging anyone to eat garbage in any way, shape or form. Um, these are completely edible, wonderful, delicious ingredients. So what is it then if it's not garbage? Scraps are the underutilized produce parts and other um, odds and ends that are often discarded. So that could be stems, like from mushrooms, herbs, bro broccoli, kale. It could be cores, like from apples and cauliflower. It could be rinds, like from cheese or melon. It could be peels from bananas, beets, apples, citrus fruits. It could be tops of leafy greens like carrots and beets or leek tops. And then it includes a whole bunch of other odds and ends too, like coffee grounds, pickle brine, and aquafaba. So if this sounds familiar to you, it's because it likely is. There's been a renewed popularity lately in reducing food waste, but this is by no means a new topic. It's just becoming mainstream again. So throughout the ages, across lands and cultures, people are no strangers to making the most of what they've got. This is all impacted by factors like generation, culture, and socioeconomic status. 
some of us are probably already really thoughtful about food waste and others of us are perhaps lucky enough to be in a position of privilege and might not always think twice if a recipe tells you to cut off and discard a kale stem, except now you are going to think twice about it. So really quickly, I just want to address how I got here to be talking about cooking with scraps. And there's really four main factors that played into that for me. Um, I really love a good challenge. I hate to see unnecessary waste. I've always been budget conscious. And I think it's important to be conscientious of our consumption. So for the first one of that, that I love a good challenge. Um, I don't know, maybe you can share in the chat if any of you are fans of this book or know where this illustration is from. This is from my all time favorite children's book. Um, it's The Boy Who Ate Flowers by Nancy Sherman. Um, it's a 1960 something cookbook or children's book. And I adored it as a kid. This young boy, Peter, as you will probably get from the title of the book, um, gets really sick of his morning oatmeal and wants to find a new food source. And so he goes to his mother's garden and starts eating flowers and they hire a French flower chef. And I just love the idea that he is finding this new underutilized food source and making these beautiful dishes from them and getting really excited about them. The second one that I hate to see unnecessary waste has been a lifelong passion of mine. I have my master's in urban planning. And for a couple of years, I worked um, at my local downtown development authority here in Ann Arbor. And at the time, we only recycled one in two plastics. That's not the case anymore. Um, but back then, that was all we would recycle. And I would just die a little bit inside after meetings when I would see people throwing away all of these other types of plastic. Meanwhile, my parents lived across the state of Michigan, two hours away in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they had single stream recycling. And so they recycled all the plastic. So I set up new recycling bins in our office and I made notes on the signs or on the bins to recycle everything that people could start recycling all of their plastic. And then I filled up my car with all of that and drove it across the state to my parents for them to recycle. Needless to say, they were very excited once Ann Arbor got a uh, single stream recycling too, and they no longer had to deal with carfuls of plastic. The third thing that I've always been budget conscious, um, for some of the time while I was growing up, my mom and I were on our own and we would go to the grocery store and we would play a game where we would add up everything in the cart as we went along. And whoever was the closest to the correct amount when we checked out won the game. I didn't learn or realize until much later in life that it wasn't actually a game. And she was doing that with me out of necessity to make sure that we stayed under a certain number, but that has stuck with me. And I've continued to keep that in mind and really stick to budgets. The fourth thing of conscientious consumption um, came into play a lot for me when I was living in Japan for two years with my husband. For the first time, we got a CSA box, um, so consumer supported agriculture. So we were getting a box of produce from our local farmers. And I really wanted to be making use of all of these things that was coming in the box, even though it was a lot of produce that I was unfamiliar with and needed to go back into the store to ask them to write it down so then I could go back and look it up. But I recognized all of the effort that these farmers near me were putting into growing these vegetables and I wanted to be putting all of that to good use. Um, one of my favorite uh, words from Japan that I learned while I was there was motanai. So it's a word that expresses regret regarding wastefulness. So it's not all that different in some ways from our phrase of waste not, want not, but Motanai manages to capture not only the shame of wasting a precious resource, but also hold on to the gratitude for what a gift it was in the first place, whether you're talking about food or time or money. So 
that's a quick overview, but um, it was a really winding path for me from my time into Jap in Japan to then I came back and worked with a couple of friends to start a website called Real Time Farms that was a way for people to help find food that they felt good about eating. So we helped people find local farmers markets and then they could learn more about the farmers that were at those farmers markets and then they could learn about the growing practices of those farmers and then eventually we added on restaurants both in our area in Michigan and then in New York also. And same idea, you could drill down on these restaurants menus and find out where they're getting all their produce from and the growing practices of those farmers. From Real Time Farms, I went to work at Food 52, a food and lifestyle website that's based in New York. Um, I wore a number of different hats during my years there, but one of them was a writer and editor and I had my own column called Cooking with Scraps. And it was really inspired by Gabrielle Hamilton's cookbook Prune um, had recently come out and we, the editors, just thought it was the coolest idea. And so I started hunting through the archives uh, because Food52 um, is a community-based website and anyone can upload recipes. I started looking for ways that people were making creative use out of scraps and sharing those recipes. And then I started sharing my own as well. And then that turned into my cookbook. So why do we want to be cooking with scraps? I like to say that cooking with scraps has a triple bottom line. Um, if any of you are familiar with Zingerman's, it is an Ann Arbor, Michigan based uh, community of businesses. There are a dozen businesses, but one of them is Zingerman's mail order and they do ship nationwide. So maybe a couple of you have heard about Zingerman's, but at Zingerman's, we say that we have a triple bottom line, which is great food, great finance and great service. So I say that cooking with scraps has a triple bottom line too, but in this case, it's the three P's. So cooking with scraps is good for your palate, it's good for your pocketbook, and it's good for the planet. So first off, your palate. Um, just like at Zingerman's, we say flavor first. This is the same thing. It has to taste good. I would not encourage you to eat something if it didn't taste good just because you're doing the right thing. All of these things that we're talking about eating taste delicious. The second P, your pocketbook. Um, in 2019, surplus food cost the country $408 billion. Of that, 70% of it was due to food waste. So the financial cost of uneaten food is greatest for consumers. Families of four can save from $1,600 to $2,200 a year simply by not throwing away food. And then the third P is the planet. Reducing food waste um, does a number of things. Um, we are throwing away 40% of the food that we grow, and that's happening at every stage in the process. So food is lost and wasted at, as you can see on this graph, um, at farms. So in the production and harvesting stage, it's wasted during the manufacturing and processing stage due to defects in the product, packaging or labeling. We're losing food during stock and transport. So when it's handled or stored or transported, and then at the market, often due to cosmetic reasons. So the consumer facing parts of this account for 28%, farms account for 21% and manufacturing accounts for 14%. So the biggest portion is households, that green wedge there, that's 37%. So that's discouraging, but it's also encouraging because it means that we can have a big impact on the problem by changing how we interact with food at home and when we're out shopping and when we eat at restaurants. So uneaten food has an impact on all of those resources that were used to produce it too. Um, if all of our country's surplus food was grown in one place, it would be a mega farm that would cover roughly 80 million acres. That's over three quarters of the size of the state of California. 
Growing the food on that wasteful farm would consume all the water used in California and Idaho combined. That farm would harvest enough food to fill a 40 ton tractor every 20 seconds. And many of those trailers would travel thousands of miles distributing food to be kept cold in refrigerators and grocery stores for weeks. But instead of being purchased, prepared and eaten, this perfectly good food would be loaded on another line of trucks and hauled to a landfill where it would emit a harmful stream of greenhouse gases as it decomposes. This is also as disheartening as that all is, it's also really tough to think about this impact on food insecurity in our country. We're wasting about a third more food than the average high income country, and that our total waste has tripled since 1960. Today, we're wasting more than a thousand calories per person per day. That's enough to feed more than 150 million people each year. I like to share this um, EPA food recovery hierarchy. It's really designed for um, not households, but um, companies and like higher level like businesses. But I think it's important for us to look at because it's important for us to think about too. So as you can see at the top, the source reduction, um, the best thing that we can do is to reduce the volume of surplus food generated. Um, the next is to use surplus food to feed hungry people, then feed animals, then industrial uses. But what I think is really striking for us is to see that composting is just one step above the landfill. And that's not a knock on composting. I'm a gardener, I love composting. It's a great thing to do if you have the space and are able to do so, um, but it's not the best thing that we could be doing with food waste. And so I think sometimes we tend to, you know, think, oh, well, I'm just gonna toss this in the compost and that's great because it's doing good things for my soil. And it is, but we really want to be doing other things before we get to that point. Um, you can find this on epa.gov if you want to read more into this and what some other com companies are doing about this. So, now I wanna circle back to our pop quiz because you have definitely heard a number of answers at this point. And if you want, um, you can test yourself and throw some answers into the chat of what you think might not be editable. And I am gonna give you just a minute or two to look at this and then I'm gonna go through the answers and I'm gonna be curious to hear um, what you were right about, what you might be surprised about. And um, maybe at the end, we can hear from some of you in other ways that you're all using some of these things too. So all but three items on this list are completely edible. The three that are not are green potato peels. You do not wanna be eating green potato peels, um, but it is totally fine to cut off the green part and go ahead and continue consuming the rest of the potato. Uh, moldy bread, as I said at the beginning, we're not encouraging anyone to eat moldy anything. Um, and then rhubarb leaves are poisonous, so don't eat those. Uh, just quickly going through the rest of the items on this list, apple cores are edible, not seeds. Um, it's okay if you eat one um, accidentally, but you don't wanna eat a number of seeds. Um, but the core themselves are completely edible. And this, along with a lot of the things that we are talking about today, is really um, culturally based a lot. Uh, one of my colleagues, when I was working at Zingerman's Bakehouse, would eat the entire apple from the bottom up and just have the seeds and the stem left. Whereas it blew my mind when I first saw it because I have been taught that you cut away around the core. And it's not that it's not edible, it's just a different texture and we're not used to it. Avocado pits are also edible. Um, this one, there isn't a ton of research about yet, but you can use it to make a liqueur and you can blend them up into smoothies, but I would go easy on that and not put like five in there again, because we don't know really what the limits are of how many avocado pits you want to be eating at a time. And, and then you can also do other things like um, use them to dye clothing too. 
Banana peels are completely edible. Um, uh, this is probably my favorite recipe in my cookbook is the banana cake that uses banana peels. Since my cookbook has come out, um, in that recipe, I have you cook the banana peels to soften them a little bit and then blend them up. Since it's come out, I've realized that for me, it's a lot more of a streamlined process for me to throw the peels or the whole bananas in the freezer and then thaw them and that softens them for you. And then you can blend them up, whether it's just the peels or the banana and the peel, and then you can use them in smoothies. You can use them anywhere else you'd be using pureed bananas. Beet greens, just like the greens of root veg, any other root vegetables, edible, delicious. Broccoli stems are one of the first ones that I feel like I really started to see major changes on in grocery stores. Uh, sometimes you just see the broccoli crown, but more and more you're seeing broccoli with the stem still attached and it's delicious. You can use it just like you're using the florets. Carrot greens sometimes get a bad reputation for being poisonous. They are not, they are just slightly bitter. So if that bothers you, you can blanch them before using them. Coffee grounds, also edible. Um, I have a recipe on Food 52 that uses them in a couple of ways in the crust of a pie and then to flavor whipping cream. I also like to mix them in with nut butters for some added texture. A note, um, speaking from experience though, that if you are using caffeinated coffee, there is still caffeine in those grounds. So just be careful what you're using them in and when you are enjoying them, unless you don't wanna stay up super late that night. Corn cobs, this is admittedly a little bit of a trick. I'm not talking about gnawing through the entire cob, but if you're cutting corn off of the cob, you can still use that cob to make stock. Um, it still has a lot of flavor left in it. Kale stems, completely edible. A lot of the times it's nice to just chop them up and then cook them first with like onion or whatever else you're cooking first in your dish to help those soften up before you're adding in the greens. Orange peels are edible. A lot of people probably guess this from candied oranges. Um, I also like to, if I'm just gonna use the orange for the juice, I like to zest citrus fruits and freeze that zest. So then you can have that flavor later on. Pickle brine, um, you can use that to re-pickle things. Like after you finish the pickles, add another vegetable in to pickle them. I like to add it to Bloody Marys and it's great for uh, potato, um, potato salad also. Pumpkin guts. I know a lot of people will save the seeds when they carve um, a pumpkin at Halloween time, but the guts are completely edible too. And the seeds of any squash can be roasted just like you would the pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin guts can be um, pureed and then used in quick breads. You can also use it in soups. Stale bread is one of my favorite scraps to have on hand. And it's, I think, one of the easiest things to do to get into cooking with scraps if this is all new to you. Um, I always have stale bread in my freezer and then I use it for croutons and breadcrumbs. Aquafaba or bean liquid um, is literally the liquid that comes from a can of beans. You can also use the liquid from cooking beans yourself. It's a little less predictable. So if you haven't worked with aquafaba, uh, before, I would recommend sticking with the can liquid, but it works just like um, egg whites. So it's nice to make a lot of vegan things. Um, and it's also can be used um, like in cocktails to make a froth instead of the egg whites. So if it just another option, watermelon rind. Um, this is often used for pickles. I like to use the um, the lighter white part to make granita, uh, so a frozen, refreshing, icy dessert. And then zucchini stems. This is another one that uh, was really new for me when I was first learning about these. I was really used to cutting off the top of that zucchini, but it's totally edible, tastes just like the rest of the zucchini. Again, it's just a different texture. Uh, this is different if you're, if you're picking up a zucchini right from the farmer's market and it's fresh, go ahead and eat it. If the zucchini has been sitting around for a long time and that stem is hard, then of course use common sense and don't go for it. Um, LJ, did you skip cheese rinds? Oh, thank you. Yes, cheese rinds. 
So this is not, um, of course, do not eat anything like wax. We're talking about just other types of cheese rinds that are just the completely natural, the cheese, no strings or wax or other elements added to it. Um, but they can be used, I like to use them for flavoring um, a batch of soup or beans. And then I also, this is another one that's good to collect in the fridge freezer. And then you can turn it into like a cheese spread by blending up little bits of leftover cheese rinds and other odds and ends of cheese that you might have after a party. Um, and then it's, it's a delicious new cheese rind uh, spread that changes every time you use it. Thank you for that catch. So as I mentioned, um, I worked at Zingerman's Bakehouse. I am still with Zingerman's, just a different company within that community of businesses. But at Zingerman's Bakehouse, I really was excited that I was able to help them reduce food waste. They were already really focused on reducing waste, but not necessarily food waste. Um, so now at Zingerman's Bakehouse, the carrots are no longer peeled for carrot cake. Apples are not peeled for apple pie. They make a lot of chicken salad. And so the chicken bones are saved to make stock. Uh, banana bread, you probably won't be surprised to hear. This is one of my favorite changes that I helped implement was now the whole banana is used in all of the banana breads that they're making. Um, this was one that I brought in samples for my colleagues of the bakehouse recipe of their banana bread with the banana peels in it. And my colleagues were not excited to try this bread. Um, understandably, because as we've already said, scraps doesn't have the best connotation all the time. But across the board, they all tried it and they all thought that the bread that had the peels in it had a stronger banana flavor. So again, flavor first, it made it better and it's a benefit for the planet because that's a drastic reduce in the composting that they had to do. So it's really about shifting mentalities, both on larger scales, like at Zingerman's Bakehouse, but then also among all of us and how we're talking to our friends. They also, um, as you can see in the image with the bread, are good about they're now milling their own grains. So stone ground flour crushes the whole grain kernel. So that includes the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. And so then you're keeping all of those nutritious vitamins, minerals, and oil in the flour versus commercial white flour, which is just the starchy endosperm part of the grain. And as an example of that, I just wanna share this um, image. It's from Instagram. It's from um, the Bread Lab. If you haven't heard of them before, these are Washington State researchers who are really focused on grains and they're focused on introducing the concept of affordability into our regional food systems, specifically to develop better tasting, healthier, affordable bread and keep the value where it is produced while not pricing people out of staple foods. So they've created a bread lab collective, which is a group of bakers and millers and plant breeders all across the country who are making um, something called the approachable loaf. It's um, a bread that is accessible and approachable as per the name with no stabilizers or other um, ingredients that are hard to pronounce in it. Um, and the bakehouse is one of the people in this collective that are making an approachable loaf. But in this example here that you're looking at, both of these two loaves of bread started with two pounds of wheat. The difference is that smaller loaf had 25% of the kernel sifted away from it. Whereas the one on the right used the full two pounds of whole wheat flour. So this is a small example of what's happening in the US. Um, we are on average eating 43 pounds of flour per year. That's 131 pounds per person. It takes us 58 billion pounds of wheat to make those 43 pounds of white flour. So it's 15 billion pounds that are sifted off annually that we're not using. And it's going to animal feed, composting, 
uh, mushroom growing medium. And again, those are great things, but not the highest and best use. So take away four strategies for reducing your food waste. The first one is meal planning. This is one that used to really rub me the wrong way. I really love going to the farmer's market and buying everything that catches my eye, flying by the seat of my pants, getting all the things. And I felt like I was really, you know, that limited me if I had to meal plan. I've since come to realize that that's not the case at all. I can still go wild at the farmer's market. I just need to take the time then when I get home to think about what all I'm buying and how I'm going to use it that week. And when I take the time to do that, I'm buying a lot less at the grocery store to fill in the gaps. The second one is proper storage. Um, again, very obvious, but one step towards reducing waste is storing your food properly so it stays fresh for as long as possible. That maximizes the time you have to use it before it spoils. If you really have no idea, think about where you found it in the grocery store. If it wasn't refrigerated at the grocery store, it probably doesn't need to be. And if it was, then it does. In general, most produce lasts longer unwashed. Um, this is one of those things though, where you need to balance it with how you're gonna use it. So I know that I will use my greens faster and more often if they are washed and waiting for me. So if that's the case for you too, then you just wanna think about the best way to store some of those things that you're washing ahead of time to again, maximize their use. For greens, I like to wash them in a salad spinner and then keep them right in the salad spinner in the fridge because it has just a little bit of moisture left at the bottom, but it's not sitting in it. And so they stay fresher longer. Another good option is to wash them and then loosely wrap them in a tea towel and then perhaps put them in a reusable storage container so they're ready and waiting for you. Herbs are one of those things that tend to go bad like as soon as you look at them. Um, so those are another one that you can benefit by paying a little extra attention to. Um, soft stem herbs like basil and dill and cilantro, you can treat just like you would a bouquet of flowers and pop them into a glass of water. Um, basil should definitely be staying out at room temperature. Others can go in the refrigerator if you like, um, ideally loosely covered with something like a plastic bag. Uh, woodier stemmed herbs like rosemary and thyme, you can treat more like greens, washing them and then wrapping them in a tea towel or something similar. Number three is putting your freezer to work. Um, with the caveat of taking the time to label what you put in there. Because again, speaking from experience, although you might think that you can tell the difference between the two types of pesto that you made, a month from now, you're gonna be second guessing yourself. I like to use a permanent marker, just like a Sharpie on zip top bags, or write with that marker on a piece of masking tape or painter's tape and put that on a freezer safe storage container. And then I recommend having a couple of back pocket recipes that you always can turn to, to use up a lot of odds and ends. For me, those are um, strata, which is what you see pictured. It's a really versatile dish for clearing out odds and ends um, and it's make ahead friendly and it can be really um, guest friendly too. It can look more impressive than it is. You're using up stale bread, random veggies, um, little bits of cheese, some leftover like meat that you might have. And like Estrada, a uh, frittata is also another good thing for this. So really the same thing minus the bread. So it's an egg base that then you're adding all of these odds and ends to. And then stock um, is the dumping ground, the good kind, uh, for all those little scraps that you can't figure out what to do with. So you will definitely see recipes for stock that include the whole vegetable. And yes, you can do that. Um, but I prefer to use as much of the vegetable as possible first and then save the scrappiest of scraps for stock. And sometimes I will have different bags 
going um, with different items, as I mentioned before, like corn cobs and then having an entire corn cob stock. Or if you start collecting lots of those cheese rinds, you can make a cheese stock that then you could use for like risotto to give it a lot of flavor. So I hope that my cookbook, Cooking with Scraps, can help you make a difference in reducing your own food waste. I intended it to be a reference point for the often unused part. I assume if you're buying uh, carrots that you probably know how to use that root, but maybe you don't know how to use the green. So they're all designed to be really approachable recipes. They're simple dishes with short ingredient lists that are hopefully a jumping off point for you to learn and then experiment with and make them your own. If any of you are bakers in the group um, and like to use metric measurements, I am completely with you. I love baking with metric measurements. Um, I think it's ideal for a lot of recipes. It was a conscious choice not to use them in this cookbook. Um, the vast majority of these recipes just don't call for that level of detail. And if it's a new concept for you, I felt that it could be another layer of having it be overwhelming to add those metric measurements. So together we can help reduce food waste by making small changes in our kitchen and spreading the word. As the quote that you're looking at says, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. And as cheesy as it sounds, um, your best really is good enough. Changing the food system starts in your kitchen. If you're cooking, you're more likely to be making wholesome choices and you're more likely to be connected to your food. And the more that you know and care about your food, the more likely you are to eat sustainably. And the more sustainable you are, the less food you waste. Together, we can help reduce food waste by making small changes in our kitchens and spreading the word. Thank you. Oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I feel like I've learned so much. I'm gonna have to think about this a lot more in the next you know, couple of days, but um, we have a ton of questions and I'm gonna just start with this one uh, that goes back to one of your slides. What was the source of the data on the slide where food waste occurs? There was a little thing down at the bottom, but I missed it. Yes, yeah, so a lot of that is coming from makefoodnotwaste.org. They are a local to me, they're in Detroit. Um, they're a great organization to check out. Um, another couple that I would recommend are refed, refed.org, uh, foodtank.com, civileats.com, savethefood.com, and then livezerowaste.org. What was that last one? Live zero waste.org. Got it. I will put all of those um, in a recap email to all of you with the video link for the recording from today. Um, all right. So my que question to start is, um, we had talked about this a little bit before we started this program was uh, about why do Americans think that these not just Americans, but why do people not think that these are things are edible? How did that happen? I think it's really cyclical, um, like a lot of things are. Like we, like we get ourselves to a good place in society where people have this knowledge and they know it and they're using it. And then, you know, like maybe we get through the depression and we have to be using everything and we, this knowledge becomes ingrained, but then we get to a better place. And then we start to lose that knowledge and it maybe doesn't get passed on from one generation to the next of how they're cooking and what they're using in the kitchen. And we don't have to ration things and worry about what we're using. And so it slips and it loses a little bit. And then we start to write recipes that tell us to cut off and discard the kale stem. And we're in a privileged enough position that we don't have to think about it. We assume that the recipe knows what it's talking about and that that's not edible. And so we cut off and discard it. And 
So we need to retrain ourselves to stop and think and ask ourselves, is this edible? How can I be using it? How can I talk to my friends and family about how they're using it and share this knowledge so that we're getting back to a place where we are respecting the food and using all of it? Mm -hmm. um, well, I do want to thank you for letting us know that the rhubarb leaves are poisonous. That <laughs> you probably saved a life tonight. <laughs> Um, a lot of people want to know how to keep, you know, a lot of our foods are sprayed with pesticides and things like that. How do you clean it well enough to cook with it? I would say my first recommendation is to head to your farmer's market so that you can talk with your local farmers about their growing practices, um, especially because they might be growing something that's not organic but they might be using organic practices. It's expensive and time consuming to get to that level. So you could still be enjoying foods that are grown like organic foods are, but not having that label on it. And then I would also recommend checking out, um, there's a list called the Dirty Dozen. And so you can see which things have the most pesticides and try to avoid those things or buy organic of those things if you can. Um, I know budgets are an issue and you know we all have to make choices about what makes sense for all of us on what we're buying organically or not. So but if we're buying like a a cheapy but apple from Shaw's or whatever, um, is scrubbing it enough to you be able to use uh, scrubbing it with soap and water, whatever, what would you use to clean it so that it it was safe? I personally don't use any kind of vegetable wash or anything. I, you know, rinse with water and scrub when it makes sense with a brush, but I don't do anything special. I, but I do pay attention to like pineapples, for example, are one of the things that has the highest level of pesticides. So I would buy an organic pineapple and still wash it then if I'm going to make a recipe where I'm using the pineapple peel. I, I might skip using it if I can't get a non-organic, an organic one. Um, a lot of people are asking for recipes or how to use um, certain aspects of the items that you had listed. And I'm just going to say that uh, Lindsay Jean has recipes in her book for all, everything. Um, you should definitely check it out from the library if you don't get to buy it from Aesop's Fable. Um, somebody asked, can you eat the inner seed from a peach pit? Um, yes, you can. Um, again, this is not one that you want to eat like 30 peach pits. Um, but all of those, the inner kernel of stone fruits do have a lot of flavor in them. And you can use those to create, um, like your own liqueur. You can use them to flavor different things for baking and then strain them out. So you're not eating them. Um, sometimes people do toast them and grind them up and use a small amount of them in baked goods. Um, but again, it's one that you would want to watch and not go overboard with. Mm -hmm. um, Linda asks uh, a little bit off to uh, food topic, but like she's read an article in the business about food, using food scraps in the Detroit free press. Is that something that you contributed to? Um, I don't know off the bat. <laughs> which article that is <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible it's totally possible <laughs> um somebody asks how to use the crisper drawers in the fridge I never know what items are low moisture medium moisture or high moisture so that I can hold them together thank you for a great presentation oh thank you uh, that's a great question I, my crisper drawers say fruits on one and vegetables on the other so I tend to stick with that um for fruits, I haven't noticed as much of a difference. Vegetables, I definitely notice more of a difference if I'm not taking the time to store them properly. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention with um, root vegetables that have leafy greens like carrots and radishes and beets, when you're buying them from the farmer's market and you're buying them whole like that, when you get them home, take the time to cut the greens from the roots and store them separately. They Both parts will last a lot longer if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. What do you use for beet skins and onion skins? Like onion skin, I think of like that really thin outer layer. Yeah, the really like most outer layer, the papery one that I would use for stock 
or you could use them non-food to be dyeing clothing and fabrics. Um, mm -hmm. They're completely fine in stock. You wouldn't want to have, maybe you would, I don't know, to each their own. I wouldn't do a stock of all papery skins because it can get bitter, mm -hmm. but in small amounts, it's totally fine. Okay. And then for beets, um, again, it's one of those things that you do not have to peel. It is completely edible, but that said, a beet in season that's freshly dug out of the ground has a much thinner, more appetizing peel than a beet at the very end of the season. And, you know, again, your choice, if you would like to peel those for textural reasons, I totally get that. They could be saved and used in stock, but they will obviously drastically change the color of your stock. Right, of course. You said something about dyes, and I saw that this in the chat as well. So you can use onion skins to dye material? Yes, it is not something that I have personally explored with a lot, but I have seen a lot of different natural ingredients being used, including food scraps to use to dye fabrics. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Diane says, I think that fewer people are cooking from scratch and tend to buy ready-made foods for whatever reason, lack of time, lack of knowledge about cooking. Do you agree? Do you think this is a trend that we, you've seen? I mean, it's definitely a trend. And I, I mean, again, that's certainly not new, you know, that's been decades that we've been taught that it's easier to get processed food and throw it in a microwave than cook for ourselves. But I would say just like scraps, that's a re-education thing for all of us that it really, it doesn't take that long to boil a great bag of whole wheat pasta and grate some fresh cheese on top and drizzle some delicious olive oil and have a salad on the side. It doesn't, it doesn't have to take that long to cook well for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, can you use food scraps to feed birds? Larry asks. Wow, Larry, that is the first time I have ever been asked this and I love getting brand new questions. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have an answer for this. I feed my birds seeds. I'm sorry. Because we put food scraps out for our groundhogs and the deer. You encourage groundhogs? We have them, so we can't, I mean, you know, might as well, okay. them, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah, and the squirrels, they'll eat anything. <laughs> I need to make a note of this to look into it more for the next time. I appreciate this question. I, I like that one too. Um, Lisa asks, can you recommend sources for less water waste or is that a completely different topic? I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a completely different topic. There are so many of these things that all tie in together. Um, I do not have a good personal source for you though. So. Yeah, that's a tough one. But do you think that you had mentioned like the, the numbers, the sheer numbers are overwhelming, but if, if we started having maybe even 20% less food wasted, how would that impact the climate, do you think? A 20% reduction in households reducing their food waste would have a huge impact on the climate. Going back to that earlier slide of households being responsible for 40% of the food waste, I mean, it could have a drastic impact. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And I think we should all do it. Um, <laughs> Somebody asked, and I know other people have asked too, um, with, if you wouldn't mind sharing a couple of your, a couple of recipes just really quickly, maybe a couple of your favorites. I saw you making the banana bread on the Food Network and I was like, oh, that's so fascinating. Yes. So that one, like I mentioned, is my favorite recipe from the cookbook. I think it's probably my daughter's too. Um, that one came about from my grandmother's banana cake recipe. Actually, it's a recipe that I would make myself for my birthday every year. And it's one of the first things when I, I really wanted the book to be organized from A to Z um, as much as possible and as include as many things as possible. So once I learned that banana peels were edible, that was my first thought of how can I make my grandma's banana cake using banana peels. Hmm. Okay. Um, was there another recipe that you thought this is, this is the bomb. <laughs> I'm going to make this all the time. Um, the next recipe that I make the most is definitely the carrot top pesto. Um, it is 
it doesn't have any cheese in it. So it could be considered not a traditional pesto. Um, and I love cheese, but this pesto doesn't need it. Um, it's just really tasty. I use it on all different things. I use it on pasta. I use it, there's a recipe for little tartlets in the cookbook. You can use it on sandwiches. It's one of the recipes that I had friends and family testing for me. And when my sister tested that one, she texted me and she was like, oh my gosh, I can eat this with a spoon just as is. It's so good. Oh, good. What did you find to be the most versatile scrap? Hmm, I would say maybe broccoli stems. Like I don't even think of it as a scrap at this point because you can use it in so many different ways. Um, you can eat it raw, just like you would the florets. You can saute it, you can grate it and turn it into slaw. I love the texture and flavor of broccoli stems. I do too. Actually. Stale bread, as I mentioned too. I think that one is super easy and nice to have on hand. Absolutely. Linda asked the question I've been wanting to ask you, where did you get your shirt? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's from Madewell. <laughs> made well okay I'm gonna be looking for that <laughs> it, it was it was tie-dyed by myself though but <laughs> <laughs> you really do everything did you use onion peels to tie-dye it <laughs> no but I should have <laughs> <laughs> um so somebody asked that I think we Americans we were talking about this a little bit earlier need to look at other cultures for ideas on eating a wider range of food scraps there are things that other cultures eat that Americans haven't heard of do you have a resource for finding out about this knowledge, like what is eaten around the world kind of thing? No, I really don't. It, for me personally, it was like exploring ingredient by ingredient and not specifically diving into different cultures, but that would be a really interesting way of learning about it too. Mm -hmm. Melanie asked the question about aquafaba, which I actually asked you as well earlier, was that um, the, she says the bean liquid contains the anti-nutrients you want to wash off when you rinse the beans. That's what she read. And I said that I find that the liquid to be very salty. Um, is there some way around that? I um, have found, I, I think I, I don't know if I buy low sodium on purpose, but I haven't found the bean liquid to be too salty. Um, it could be experimenting with different brands too and seeing what works best for what you're using it for too. Um, like chickpea liquid tends to have less flavor and obviously less color than the liquid from a can of black beans. So in some cases that would be preferable. I am not a dietitian, so I am not gonna touch the nutrient question. <laughs> okay. Um, but the, what, the liquid in cans is literally just water and the, the stuff at the bottom is, is what happened when they, you know, the beans were in water for however long, is that right? Yes, yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> someone in the chat, somebody suggested using baking soda wash for fruits and vegetables. Um, but I read that cooking vegetables with baking soda leaches vitamins. Is that? Uh, again, not a dietitian or a nutritionist, but I mean, cooking vegetables in general leaches some of the nutrients from it. Mm -hmm. right. But, you know, that doesn't mean we should only eat raw vegetables, so. Are there vegetables that have more nutrients in them uh, if once cooked than others? Or scraps, I'm gonna stay with scraps. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't safely answer any of the nutritional questions. Oh, okay, all right, all right, I'll move away from that. Mary asks, what do you do with avocado pits? I personally use them to make a uh, liqueur with them. That was delicious. Um, it has been a couple of years since I tried this, but I think I remember um, drying them out by roasting them and then um, grinding them and then um, soaking, steeping them in alcohol to flavor it. Mm -hmm. But then since then, I have read of people blending them up into smoothies. I have not tried that one. And I also don't have a Vitamix. I would not recommend this with just like a generic blender. You would need a high powered commercial grade blender to do that. So is there 
I guess I just always throw the avocado pits out. Is there like a soft center within them or something that you use? No, it's the whole, it's the whole pit that you're using. Hmm. Okay. I also recommend growing your own avocado plant just because it's fun. <laughs> Deborah said the same thing. You can grow a tree from an avocado. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's next for you, Lindsay Jean? We were talking about this earlier as well. You have another book coming out in October. I do. I'm really excited to share. Um, it's called Celebrate Every Day. It is not scrap related at all, but it is about, um, just as the title suggests, celebrating every day, celebrating the big moments and the little moments. It is um, from Zingerman's Bakehouse, and it includes a variety of recipes for the entire year. So big holidays like Christmas and Hanukkah to small things like World Friendship Day and snow days and the last day of school. Um, so yeah, and it's, I'm really excited about it. Mm -hmm. And other than writing cookbooks, um, is, is there something else, uh, is there anything else you're doing in terms of sustainability in your world? Um, well, I'm also an artist and I have a piece that'll be coming up in Grand Rapids um, has art prize is a citywide um, art competition and celebration this fall. Mm -hmm. And I, my art pieces are generally made with jeans. So I, I like textiles and reusing fabrics in that way. Oh, wow. You really are the Renaissance person. <laughs> um, so do you have any last um, suggestions for us for being, for cooking with scraps or looking at scraps differently than what we're used to? I would just say to give yourself the grace to be imperfect and to just be excited about the learning process and trying new things. And I would love to hear about your journey. I am on Instagram. It's just my name and you can feel free to send me direct messages with questions or just share photos of what you're making. Awesome. I love food photos. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this. It's been really enlightening and um, delightful. And I will be in touch about maybe an after October 3rd talk again, because that sounds amazing. Um, thank you everybody for being here and your questions. And um, I hope you all start cooking with those scraps, you know, put them in your freezer, do what you need to do, save the planet a little bit at a time. So have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye.